Welcome to the latest installment of Tiber's Watchcast, an audio extension of the Substack newsletter Tiber's Watch List. Today, we have the fourth in our series of podcasts devoted to the classics of the new millennium, conversations about those movies that have come out since the year 2000 and can legitimately or arguably be called great. My guests have up to now included film critics like Rolling Stone's David Fear and Slate's Dana Stevens. But today we have something different and uh, special, a guest from the filmmaking side of things to help us garner insights into not just what we see on the screen, but the art and craft and collaboration and thinking of what went into putting it there. So please welcome Mason Daring, a film composer who got to start scoring the films of John Sayles, and in fact, has scored almost every one of Sayles' films, including classics like The Return of the Secaucus 7, Mate One, Hate Man Out, uh, and Lone Star. He's composed the music for other acclaimed indie films as well, including Nancy Savoca's Dogfight, Don Russo's The Opposite of Sex, and my wife's favorite movie of all time, A Walk on the Moon. Uh, Mason has been a watch list subscriber and incisive participant from the beginning. And when I thought of bringing in a guest with production experience, he was my first ask, because I've long been wanting to have a discussion about film music, how and when it's created, what goes into underlining a film's action, when to lay it on, when to go silent. Uh, Mason's choice of a 20th century classic to talk about, film and score, was Michael Clayton, the 2007 corporate thriller written and directed by Tony Gilroy, starring George Clooney and Tilda Swinton, and with a score by James Newton Howard, one of the most tireless film composers of our time. Um, before we started talking about the movie, first of all, welcome, Mason. Thanks. Um, before we started talking about the movie, I, I wanted to talk about your career and um, and also get maybe a little under the hood of what's involved in composing scores for films. First of all, my understanding is you did not set out to become a film composer. You began your career as a lawyer, uh, an entertainment lawyer, if I'm yeah, not correct. If I'm correct. That's, it's, it's an odd way to back into a, a lifetime career, isn't it? About that. Yeah, I was, well, I was, I was a rock and roller. I worked my way through college playing guitar and I was with a band. We were signed to Columbia and some of the guys didn't get along. I couldn't keep them together. And, uh, and then Clive Davis got fired and basically we got dropped. Um, I, I had signed then to do a solo album, got dropped. And I said, oh my God, what am I going to do with my life? I'm a miserable failure. So I went to law school. And uh, um, and uh, and when I got into law school, I met a woman named Jeannie Stahl. We started playing music. And then I got real serious about it while I was in law school. I'm still playing with her 50 years <laughs> later. And, uh, um, and, and then I just got lucky. I, I, I mean, how, how do we, how do our paths cross the people that mean so much to us? Uh, somebody called and said uh, that they knew someone who was looking for a lawyer to make a homemade movie uh, with his own money he'd saved. And I said, never mind. I, I said, I never get paid. These movies never get made. And they said, his name's John Sales. And I said, that's funny. I just read a fabulous book called Union Dues by a guy named mm. John Sales. And they said, it's the same guy. And I said, forget everything I just said. I'll hold his coat, you know. And uh, and his car broke down on the way to see me that day. I was living in Brooklyn. And um, and I um, I really love cars. I'm a gearhead. So I went and fixed his car with him. And we spent the afternoon under a Ford Maverick in, in East Boston <laughs> parking lot. And I got it running. And uh, by that time, we were friends. And we still are. Have you scored every one of his films or have there been a couple you've missed? There was one I didn't do, Baby It's You didn't have a score. It had Springsteen songs right. as a score. So I didn't do that. Uh, that's wow. better than all the others. And is your relationship, I, I, I know he was in town just uh, last week or the other week. Um, are, you, yes. are you still working together? Is he still making films? Well, he hasn't made one in about 10 years. He's tried. He's had trouble getting financing for a couple of months. He had one called I Pass This Way, a screenplay so magnificent. I, I keep hoping he's going to get, and they're still looking into making that. It's a Western. Um, it's absolutely terrific, terrific screenplay. 
Um, he has a new book out called Jamie McGilvery, which is a tome. I mean, 700 pages in, and it is, I couldn't put it down. I mean, it's a sensational book and his book tour is doing very well because his reviews have been excellent. And uh, he did a thing called Earful, which is an interesting idea someone had here in town um, where you have a combined author reading and concert. And he mm -hmm. called and said, I'm doing the author reading in, in Boston for that, would you do the show? And uh, Jeannie was available. So we went in and and did a short set before he did his reading. And uh, it was, uh, well, first of all, the set we had was great. The crowd, could, you, the, you, they were wonderful. It's as good a show as I've ever done, but not as good as his reading, because his reading was really amazing. People mm. went nuts. So uh, he's he's in great shape these days. Good, glad to hear it. And a great so, friend, I, 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 John and I, you know, thank God, we, thank God we're such great friends, because um, it, uh, it made a difference in all the work we did together. We had mm. never, I never had a bad moment. I think it's 17 films. Not a bad moment. Is, is there one particular score of those 17 or of your career in general that you feel most satisfied with, that you feel like you nailed it? Um, with For John's movies, uh, I mean, I, I can't single one out. Eight Men Out was a real satisfying mm -hmm. jazz score. And it's hard to do jazz in movies, but it worked. Um, Lone Star was all over the map, but that seemed to resonate with an awful lot of people. And it wouldn't work if the music hadn't worked. Um, and uh, Rona Nish, I sold the most number of records. I sold a lot of records. I kind mm -hmm. of caught the the uh, river dance wave. And, um, and, and that worked, even though I'm an American doing Irish music, I got away with it. <laughs> Um, so let's talk about your, your, um, getting into film music. So you're coming from a rock and roll background, not to mention a legal background. When you started composing or as you moved further into it, did you look to any particular influences? Were there, uh, film scorers who you particularly admired? Where were you starting to pull your sounds from? Or did you just start from scratch? You know, I, I wasn't smart enough to study. Uh, the, um, I mean, I taught at Berkeley for 15 years. I just retired um, because they have a huge film scoring program and I'm lecturing at SCAD in Savannah now, but mm -hmm. but I didn't study it at all. I never studied it. I, 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 um, I should mention, I was also made a living uh, while I was just getting out of law school before the practice got going, uh, directing TV commercials. And so- huh. I learned, and I never shot a frame at 16. I started off in 35. I was lucky. So I learned to edit. And I knew quite a bit about filmmaking. So I came, as a composer, I knew more about filmmaking than any composer I've ever met, which turned out to be handy when I had to do music in front of the camera, because John Sayles, for example, loves to have people playing music and singing in the camera. And there's a certain way that has to be done to allow uh, you to edit with absolute freedom. It also helped me get uh, the biggest movie I ever did, which was Music of the Heart with uh, Wes Craven directing Meryl Streep. And so I had a background in filmmaking, but I certainly didn't have a background in scoring. I, I did play trumpet and symphonies. I, I mean, I was classically trained on that instrument, but I was pretty much at sea for the first five or 10 movies I did. I was just hanging on by my teeth, you know, uh, trying to figure out the technique there. Um, but I was able to cobble it together. And, and then I, when I started doing orchestral pieces, um, I, uh, I needed the help of an orchestrator. We, we all do really, it's overwhelming with that one, but between doing with a friend of mine, Martin Brody, I did the, the themes for frontline and Nova and frontline's actually still on the air 40 years later, mm. same piece of music. Um, I learned to to morph into an orchestral com composer, which which I really enjoyed. Walk on the Moon was an example, mm -hmm. um, uh, or Music of the Heart. Not so much for John. Ronan Nish, I did some, but J John doesn't care for orchestra music as much. He, he finds it too manipulative, I think. So uh, when you're not working, what's the opposite of an orchestral music? Are you small combos? Um, are you um, dealing? Yes, very small. Um, Passion Fish, for example. I dealt primarily with um, accordion and guitar. Um, mm. And I dealt, uh, of course, in, in Rona Nish, I dealt with actual Irish instruments, uh, yellow pipes, um, fiddle. Um, 
I'm very happy in the rock and roll world, of course. I'm a guitar player, and uh, and I used I've used a lot of guitar in my days. But it's kind of fun to um, to try to use. I, I did a movie of John's um, set in the Philippines uh, called Amigo, and I used Philippine traditional instruments. It's fun to research that sort of thing because mm -hmm. it was set in 1900. So I wanted some absolute Philippine instruments, um, and I went to the Philippines to record that with John. Um, after, just after he was done shooting it. Um, and I, I like doing an indigenous, indigenous music. Uh, it's really fun. I've done a couple of Latin, Latin scores that worked out pretty well for, for John's films that were set in Central or South America. Um, I like that challenge. It, it means you don't get pigeonholed because it's mm. so easy to get pigeonholed in Hollywood. And uh, for me, I got pigeonholed as someone who did... <laughs> My agent once called me. He sounded alarmed. He said, someone told me the other day you're an ethnomusicologist. And he made it sound like something you could get five to 24 in Soledad, you know? I said, I said, no, 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 Stan. No, 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 no. An ethnomusicologist writes papers. I write notes. All right. Mm -hmm. I never took one of those. I'm, I'm innocent. I'm not guilty of that. Trust me. He said, well, how do you do those scores? And I said, we just listen to the music from that it's drawn from, whether it's 1920 jazz or Mate One 1919 West Virginia. Mm. Um, just listen to that music and find some people that know how to play it and hire them, lean on them, be nice. <laughs> it gets, you get through the day. Yeah. So uh, take, take us under the hood a little bit in terms of the process. At what point do you start thinking about the music? Um, at what point? what are your initial choices and how much is that is led by the filmmaker? And I imagine it differs from film to film and filmmaker to filmmaker, but if you could speak to just the general outline of the process. Well, um, once, once you have the job, once you've been asked to do it, um, the first thing up is spotting and, that, and that's a very synergistic day. It's really an amazing, it, it's really fun. It's the first thing that happens um, among a small cabal, if you will. It's the director, the picture editor, the music editor, and the composer. And generally speaking, it's just those four people in a mm -hmm. room. And, and it can often happen in one day, one long day. Sometimes you spill over to a second day. But basically, you go through the movie and decide where each and every cue is going to be, where it's going to start, where it's going to stop, and who it's going to play for. Um, what's the nature of it? Sometimes, um, Frequently, all too frequently, in my opinion, you get swayed by temp music. They, it, 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 it's tough making a film in a funny way. You never get to see your movie for the first time. A composer mm -hmm. is brought in and there's a rough cut or a fine cut with temp music in it. And he or she, the composer, gets to see the movie for the first time, but the director never does. By the time they get, you know, composer is the last thing in the assembly line. Right. By the time they get around to the composer, they're so sick of their movie. They can't stand it and, and they're bored out and they don't know if it's any good because they've created it from bits and pieces that they themselves shot. And they really don't. They're, they're at sea. Mm -hmm. um, and it's fun to, to be the person that comes in and says, hey, don't worry. This is a really good movie. You know, <laughs> you, 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 you're in good shape here. Just sit back and let me do what I do. But a lot of times you're going to be swayed by temp music. Um, the things they've taken from anywhere they feel like and often it'd be sweeping huge scores. Mm -hmm. You know, they'll they'll tempt things from John Williams, you know, who has a million, two million dollar budget. And, and they say, here's 50,000. I'll go do it. And, <laughs> you know, they want you to do the plagiarism waltz where everybody recognizes the music except the lawyers of the people that wrote it to begin with, you know. <laughs> and, uh, and and you've got to watch that. Besides, but you've got to convince the, the director. And by the way, it's a director's medium. You don't worry about anybody else in feature films. Right. Um, and, and the editor and the editors are terribly important. I, I get along with editors. I used to be one, but I get along with editors really well because I, I have such respect for what they've done and, and, and how they've forged an alliance with the director. And I look to them for, for what they think. It's very important that you get along with the editor. Um, and as a result, usually you're off and running after that first day you've got an idea. And then, then you've got to start cobbling these cues together, bring them in. Nowadays, we have our sample, if we're doing an orchestral score, samples are so good. You can mm. do a pretty good approximation of what it's going to be like. Uh, that was a problem. Once, I mean, back in the old days with Henry Mancini and guys like that, they would sit on a piano and say, I'm going to play you this cue, I'll play you this cue, and then the cellos are going to do this, and the oboes are going to do that. But honestly, a lot of drama went down at the end 
because you went into the orchestral session at the very end. And if it didn't sound like what they thought it was going to sound like, you had a problem. And there was a lot of drama in those days. Now you can head that off at the pass by giving them a sketch on synthesizers. And if they like that, they're going to love the final one. Mm -hmm. When you're dealing with odd instruments, um, you know, whether it's Latino or Irish or rock and roll, that's a little hard to approximate. You kind of have to get people in the studio and actually start playing and hope that you don't shoot your budget while you're trying to fumble onto like opposite of sex was like that. That was a, that was a, an interesting score because I was on a different, I was in Boston and Don was in LA and I would play him things over the phone. You do that sometimes. What was um, the intru- instrumentation that was, on that film? That was uh, that, that actually the, the music people, it's a funny story there. Uh, there's a movie called something's got to give with Jack Nicholson yep. and, Um, The phone rang one day and it was a guy from Sony said, we got a problem here. He said, um, Nancy Myers is shooting this, you know, is making this film. Something's got to give with Jack Nicholson, Diane Keaton and Hans is doing the music. Well, I know Hans. I mean, Hans is great. Um, He said, there's a problem in a scene. They edited your music using your music from Opposite of Sex. It's a samba. I did a lot of sambas in Opposite of Sex. And that's another story, how I stumbled upon that. Um, And... uh, and she loves it. She was ten- demo love. She fell in love with the first thing you hear that works is the last thing you want to hear. And poor Hans, he's writing, I'm sure he's writing great music. He never wrote a bad note in his life. He's writing all these cues and she's flunking them left to right. And finally he said to her, well, if you like Daring's music so much, why don't you just use that? And and it turned out they were both Sony films. So Sony huh. actually had the, had the rights to it, but they needed my permission. I said, well, sure, let me tell you how to, <laughs> how to spell the name on the check. And, uh, <laughs> And uh, and they use it, and it's a huge scene in the middle. It's a it's a, a thing where they're they're flirting with each other, sort of texting on com- on computers or, and mm-hmm. email, and they're in different rooms in the same house, and they have been contentious. And this is the first time they're actually getting along by flirting with each other with tweets. And it's a it's a two minute montage. In fact, the music of mine they used was so short they had to loop it, and ah. uh, for that scene, and um, and and that can happen. You fall in love with your with your demo music, you know, it just yeah. editors liked that score from opposite of sex because it was perky and it had a lot of energy. And so they would use it to cut scenes. And this one, mm-hmm. they used it to cut the scene too. And there it, it is. Stuck. Um, and, but Hans Zimmer got the credit. You didn't get any credit on the, uh, on you the know, I, I looked at it and I didn't see it, but somebody called me just a, a little while. I mean, a few weeks ago and said, I saw your name on something's got to give. I didn't know you did the music for that. I said, well, I sort of did one little bit of it, but I didn't think they had my name anywhere. And he said, no, I saw it right there. So apparently they changed. I think they went and added it later. I'm not sure. Uh-oh, I'll have to go back. I didn't threaten story. anybody. <laughs> I'm easy. <laughs> uh, so one last question about this is, uh, so when you get to the arranging and the recording, how does that change things? I mean, it sounds like you're saying samples are so good now that it's not nearly as much of a wrench as it used to be. Yeah. But, um, you have to be able to change. I I, I worked once with um, Peter Yates, uh, mm-hmm. what a wonderful man. He'd done Bullet and Breaking Away, and I did his last film. It was um, a separate piece. It was a Showtime mm-hmm. movie, um, and we got all the way. And he, he 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 was a wonderful man. He was ninety at the time, and he was one of these. You know, he'd call you up at ten o'clock at night and say, "It's Peter. I just want to know I'm listening to the music. It's lovely. Click." <laughs> that's it you kill yourself for somebody like that you know um but we got into the final thing we were recording and one cue just did not work and i tried to make some changes to it and he didn't like and i thought wait a minute i'm i'm going around this wrong i said just lay it to one side folks we're gonna move on to the next cue and when we took a lunch break i sat down and i thought to myself well what's going to work and I realized there was another cue I could drop some instruments of and cut and just do manipulate it on the spot, a totally different approach to it. And he said, that's lovely. Thank you. Um, so you do sometimes have to back and fill a lot at the last minute. Um, maybe even take a pencil to paper and write something. Um, a lot of times editing. I worked with David Chase, um, who went on to do The Sopranos. My very first job in Hollywood was doing a... Uh, Alfred Hitchcock presents. They were redoing them. David Chase writing this episode. I got it through a fluke, um, and uh, and 
everything was fine except for one. Once again, one cue, he just didn't like it. And, and, I, and I realized he was right. It wasn't a good cue. I'd written it wrong. Um, I only did, it took one, I only had one day to do that job, by the way. So I could be forgiven for screwing up one cue. And I looked at it and I just realized I could take another cue that wasn't really necessary and drop the drums from it because there was a bunch of people walking around in the desert trying to kill each other. And I didn't want any drums in the desert. And uh, and so I dropped the drums out of that. And David looked at me and said, thank you. I said, you bet, uh, you bet. And so sometimes you have to really scramble right at the end. Yeah. Um, before we talk about Michael Clayton, um, who are your peers that you admire? Who are some, some current composers that you um, that that you look to and just feel like they're doing doing the right job, the good job? Um, well, one of the reasons I picked Michael Clayton is James Newton Howard. I'll talk more about him in a second. Um, mm -hmm. um, John Williams, I, I, I've met John a few times. Uh, you know, he's not only a marvelous man, he just, he may be the greatest one who ever lived, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, he really, the man has a gift with melody. Um, and uh, and he knows how to work with the director, obviously. Um, uh, if you want to listen to a score of his that no one ever talks about, listen to uh, Accidental Tourist. Because I, mm. I looked at that movie and I said to myself, I had I would have nothing to say. It's a small, quiet movie. I got nothing to say here. And everything he says is perfect. Perfect. Mm. It's a very understated score by him. He's quite capable of doing that, obviously. Um, Nicholas Bertel is an interesting guy. I've never met him, but he came out of the finance. I mean, he did sort of what I did. He came out of a financial world. He, he was a financial analyst huh. working for some huge you know, company in New York City. And um, I don't know how he got his first job. I have no idea how he did it, but he's a genius. I mean, he's just real good at what he does. And uh, and I, I admire his work a lot. Things have changed in the last few years, you know, back in the 80s and 90s when when I was starting out sort of, or when I was busiest, there were only 300 of us maybe doing it in the world. I mean, it was tiny. Uh, you, uh, Variety used to print a music edition every year and they would list all the composers and their agents. And it would be about four pages. Well, mm. it looked like the New York phone book today. Um, I mean, there are so many composers and I, I don't know most of them. Um, if I've, if I go, turn on TV and, and see streaming shows, I I don't know a lot of these people. Um, never heard of them, and, and they I, I don't know how they all get work. Um, and is that that because there's just so much more content that they they there are more people needed to compose, or, or why why the uh, the it's, groundswell? It's technology plays a huge. You, you know, mm. you can do a lot with a laptop now. Yep. Um, yep. Uh, you can really do a lot if you know what you're doing with a laptop. When when I was starting out playing, when I was a rocker, you know, you had to have a, a deal. You had to have a deal with a major label so they give you fifty thousand, a hundred thousand dollars to go to recording studio because it was so expensive. Well, now people have two mics at home and a laptop. They don't need a recording studio. Uh, in it's just so accessible. Uh, it's just like filmmaking. I mean, with a, with Adobe Premiere, anybody can cut a movie now. Um, it used to be that you had, you know, a Steenbeck or a Moviola, the, the editing machines that were a fortune to buy and operate. And now they, they don't have that. So it, it, it's technology is so accessible. People are teaching themselves. Um, and sometimes, we'll talk a little bit about sound design in a few minutes, and sometimes the tail wags the dog. The sounds mm -hmm. are shaping the movie. Um, the movie's not shaping the sounds. Um, and, and that could be a problem. But there seem to be a lot of people out there getting work that I'm not sure have studied very hard on it. And I, and, I, uh, and some of them are quite good. You know, talent doesn't care where you went to college. Um, mm -hmm. So it's possible for some people to teach themselves and actually do a real good job. Um, Though I think the best composers are still relatively are classically trained to a certain degree. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think about movies like Social Network. Um, that score was the first sound design score I, I just wanted to applaud. I want to stand up and cheer um, uh, Atticus Ross and Trent Reznor. It's musical. Uh, it, it's, it's so musical, that score. And yet they did it all with machines. Um, mm -hmm. I think they did it all with machines. Um, and unfortunately, sometimes 
there's not enough music in these scores. It's just sounds because they're interesting sounds. Sound design is a very fascinating thing. You're hearing things you've never heard before. People are mesmerized by the sound, but the overall dramatic quality is a little lacking sometimes. Hmm. You point to a score that is like almost completely sound design rather than uh, than musical. Blade Runner, probably. I can't remember mm -hmm. who did it. Um, I can't remember who did it. Um, uh, any horror film. Mm -hmm. <laughs> any horror film you, you want to go see. It's all sound design now. Yeah. Um, and uh, and sometimes it upsets me because I think, oh, come on, give me a melody I can hang my hat on, you know. Mm -hmm. just, just give me something to whistle on the way home, please, you know. <laughs> and, uh, and, I, and I don't want to ever get it. Um, so let's talk about Michael Clayton. So I watched the film the other day uh, for the first time since it came out in 2007. Um, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the plot and, and the themes of it in a second. Um, holds up very, very well, uh, in part because it's such a spare story, so cleanly written. Um, and um, it's really timeless and it's narrative efficiency, really, it's storytelling. Um, and the, and the characterizations are so pared down. Um, but I was also quite struck by James Newton Howard's score, which is actually quite minimal. Um, you know, when you, uh, foolish me, when a composer suggests a score, I was expecting something bigger. Um, and it's not a big score. It's actually very subtle. Um, and I wanted to ask you, and it's not orchestral um, until- uh, I, What? It's it's almost all sound design. It's yeah. musical design, but sound design. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to ask you, what made you choose this film and this uh, this score out of all the options? Well, um, when I read your list, uh, I was torn. It was either going to be this or Children of Men, and I don't I don't know much about the music on Children of Men. I just love the movie. Um, mm. I th there's a curious intersection, personal uh, in this movie for me. Tony Gilroy was a client of mine when I was a lawyer. Tony Gilroy was in a band called um, The Night Visitors. And it was one of these bands that kind of put it together with a bunch of really good musicians in Boston. And they figured they're going to get a big music deal. Mm -hmm. And it sometimes happens. It just didn't happen. Uh, I, I signed their management agreement, I think. I can't quite remember what I did for them. But they were, uh, but, and I didn't know I, I met them once or twice. But the other, the drummer in that was is a member of the Boston Film Critics Society. That's Tim Jackson. Oh, yeah, I know Tim. Yeah. yeah. Well, Tim's a great drummer. Tim played on, on Lone Star. Um, Tim, is, Tim is one of my favorite drummers. I didn't know. And, uh, and he's, also an, he's also an actor as well. I didn't know. He yes, up. he's yeah. an actor. Tim can do a lot of stuff and do it yeah. well, I might add. Uh, he's, a, he's a fabulous drummer. And... Um, and so Tim was in the Night Visitors, and that's how he came to me and asked me. We'd, we'd played together some uh, before that and asked me if I would do their, I think it was a management agreement. Um, and so I, I met Tony Gilroy. I don't remember him well. Um, but when it didn't work out, poor Tony had to go to New York and become rich and famous in the movie business. You know, <laughs> he, made, he managed to pick himself up off the pavement pretty well. And so I heard he was doing that movie and I followed it with interest and I went to see it. I couldn't believe how much I, I love that movie. James Newton Howard, I know slightly, um, we played golf together a couple of times. We had the same age. And uh, he's a rather quiet, reserved man. I, I mean, I don't know him well, uh, um, but I, I was watching A Sixth Sense when it came out. Mm -hmm. And I thought to myself halfway through the movie, I thought, this is a perfect score. It's just perfect. Um, there's not a note misplaced. It, it, and the thing about James is he, he will sacrifice himself for the movie. You know, some mm. composers think movies are two-hour music videos with regrettable dialogue. <laughs> um, and not James. I mean, he is a servant of the film, and he does it just, he, he's very meticulous. Um, I happen to think Michael Clayton's a perfect score, too. Um, I just... It, it, first of all, it's spotted beautifully. It, 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 look at the end of the movie um, mm -hmm. when his brother says to Michael Clayton, stay close. That's the last dialogue in the movie. And then he walks away and, and it doesn't start right then. He goes up an escalator or something and then it starts. I mean, the spotting of when dialogue happens and, and the, the big scenes happen with no music. But, right. but I'd like to talk about one scene 
that happens with music that is really gripping. Um, next time, if I see James again, I, I must ask him about this scene because I'd like to know how it came about. It, it's it. First, can, can, can I can I interrupt just yeah. sort of for the listeners yes. to know what the movie's about? Um, yes, please, please. Oh, yeah. Um, so this is a movie about um, a law firm fixer played by uh, George Clooney, the title character. Uh, he is an outer borough boy. His dad was a cop. He's uh, sort of the odd one out in his white shoe firm. He's never going to be partner, but he's the guy they send out to deal when the client runs over somebody with his Porsche. He's the guy they send out to deal with him. Um, and he is, when we meet him, he's in the hole for a restaurant that uh, that went belly up. Uh, he owes some money to some unsavory characters. Uh, he's divorced. He's dealing with a, a young son. His life is kind of in a shambles. Meanwhile, um, the, a lawyer in his firm played by Tom Wilkinson, who's a, a friend of Michael Clayton's, who is representing a evil chemical firm um, and, and that's trying to defend themselves from a lawsuit against um, um, a bunch of people who've been, you know, stricken with cancer due to their weed killer. Um, that lawyer goes spectacularly bonkers in a deposition and has a mental breakdown. And Tom Wilkinson actually was Oscar nominated, I believe, for the role um, right. and is terrific uh, in the part. Um, the other important character uh, is um, Tilda Swinton, who is the chemical company's general counsel. Um, and uh, Tilda Swinton did win an Academy Award, supporting award for her role, who is needs to shut down this lawyer, this who's gone crazy by any means necessary. And that's when things start to get dark. Um, but the film really is focused primarily on Michael Clayton. And it's a film about corruption how deep it reaches, how much you let it into your life, and about what it takes to reclaim your soul, your, if not your innocence, your good standing as a human. Um, and it's a movie that is, again, it's written and directed by Tony Gilroy. It's very cleanly told. There's not a lot of frills. Um, it's close to the ground, and it's the way it observes its characters. And the music really follows suit. Um, I noticed that the music doesn't, as you pointed out, the music doesn't underline the dialogue at all. The music will wait until a dialogue scene is done and then we'll start to fill in. Um, there's a big monologue that uh, George Clooney's character gives to his son in a car. And, and I was thinking, oh man, this is the kind of thing that you could Mickey Mouse like crazy, that you could, another composer might just bring up the strings to let you know how important, emotionally important this is. And it's not, it's silent. And then only at the end does he start to bring in the music. And I will point out, again, it's not orchestral. It's it's a synthesizer and it's, a, it's very percussive. The score is very percussive. And I, I would love you to speak about the way he created these sounds. But I also don't want to cut you off. You were talking about the one scene you wanted to talk about. Well, well I, I want uh, the the most dramatic musical scene for me, uh, and uh, um, and I actually have it queued up on a TV behind me. I, I might, if, if it works, I like to play about ten seconds of the music. Sure, because James. It, it, here's here's the lecture on movie music gets broken down into two pieces: score or source. Score is two people kiss, you hear a thousand violins. Um, source is you hear a thousand violins and it turns out you cameras in a music hall. The, right. the score, source is is justified by action on the screen. People turn a radio on, that's source. If they walk into a bar and people are singing on stage, that's source. Um, right. The fancy word for it is diegetic. Or, you know, diegetic, a, diegetic. Right. That's what I learned word in film school. Word for the day. Um, yeah. uh, Every now and then, you have a combination of the two, and that happens here. Um, and um, in this scene, Tom Wilkinson is—he's just had a—he's just had a, an exchange on a street with Michael Clayton, and he goes in, and he is bonkers, as you say, and he takes—he listens to an ad for this chemical company, right. and he records the music from the ad on a cassette deck. He then takes a cassette. And, and moves it over to a stereo, plays it up really loud, and calls Tilda Swinton's character. 
and unbeknownst to him, or maybe beknownst to him, he's being uh, eavesdropped on by her right. political operatives. Um, but he goes crazy in a conversation with her. And while he's doing that, this music from the ad for the chemical company that he's looped, we saw him loop it. Mm -hmm. it, it why on earth he's decided to make, you know, a score for this diatribe is beyond me. But but it, it it's hard to follow. And yet it's mesmerizing that this music is playing so loud in the room behind him as he's leaving this long vitriolic message explaining that he has the proof that, you know, that they knowingly poisoned many, many, many people. Mm -hmm. He's got an internal memorandum and he quotes from it. Yes, here we are. It, it, something happens in the scene that I didn't catch the first time. And that is that, first of all, James Newton Howard wrote that music, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of times when you have source music, it's a neat, what's called a needle drop. The, they have someone called a music supervisor who's not the composer, and they go out and buy stuff. I recommend to my students, uh, I say, look, write your own source music. I did all of John's source music. I always wrote the songs. I recorded the songs. For one thing, it helps him out. It's a lot cheaper than buying a famous song. Mm -hmm. Two, it's more fun to write and record a piece of rock and roll. Three, you own it. You can use it for other things later in your life. And and, and, and also, here's the real reason you do it, because it's going to fit the scene exactly. If you write source music for a scene, it's going to be better than going through a thousand songs and trying to find the one that fits that scene best. You write it, you got it nailed automatically. And John mm -hmm. loved it. John will often write write the lyrics for some of the songs we did. Um, he wrote a lot of stuff with me for Mate Juan, um, Brother from Another Planet, I think he did a couple. Um, anyhow, um, so if you write your own source music, what James has done here is, I'm sure he's written this music. He's written music for an ad for a chemical company, knowing that at the same time, that has to be the backdrop for a guy going bonkers, screaming at somebody, explaining that he's he's sort of blackmailing them, but he, he doesn't want money. He wants them to stop killing people is what he wants. During the middle of this, there's a cutaway to uh, Michael Clayton and his son, to George Clooney's character and his son. Now, there's no way that's sourced because they're in another home in another town. And so at that point, it becomes score. Hmm minute then they go back to um the, to uh, tom wilkinson's character's apartment where he's screaming at at her and me and we also see these two evil villains um who are who have him wiretapped they're listening to it as he leaves a message on tilda swinton's uh phone so all these people are listening to this music but not all of them are actually hearing this music. we're hearing it while we see these people but not all those people can actually hear this music mm -hmm. we even saw the swinton on a um in a, in a gym she's exercising she's not listening to this music she doesn't know she's getting a phone call she listens to it later and she freaks out um so it's a most brilliant use of this music for uh, it starts out as a source but clearly is also used as score. It's a very unusual moment in music in a movie. And it works beautifully because you see how crazy Tom Wilkinson is and how freaked out everybody is by what he's proposing to do, which explains something that happens shortly thereafter. Um, right. And, and the, but the music also becomes um, dramatic commentary uh, yes. by the way he's using it. Exactly. And, and, and it's very unusual to be able to get away with that. A lot of times scores... You see, you see, if there was an Argentine movie, I've forgotten what it was called, but the, the people were kissing and, and, you, and you heard a thousand violins, but then it turns out they're in a concert. The, 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 the camera sweeps around and there's a thousand violins playing on the stage and you realize you've been fooled. It's, it's actually source music. It's not score music. Usually when that happens, it calls attention to itself and it pulls you out of the movie. The problem with trying to do scores is it's a cute move and it can backfire on you. And people think, oh, I thought that was score, but no, you know, and, and they're not thinking about the movie anymore. And you got to you got to get them back in the film. Not so this one. It is seamless. It's a beautiful piece of music and really, really frames a lot of different people at a certain. It's about halfway through the movie. Mm -hmm. and, it, and the thing about James um that i admire about him um is that he there's no themes in this if there's one theme you just heard it but th there are no themes in this movie 
And it's not that James is incapable of writing a theme. The theme he did for ER, the TV show, was one of the greatest opening credit themes ever written for television. So he's quite capable of doing a beautiful sweeping melody. He just says it's not what the movie needs here. And, mm -hmm. and I remember that's why I like Sixth Sense, his score for that. There's no, I, I don't remember any melodies from Sixth Sense. I just remember what a great movie it was and how good the music was every step of the way. He, he, he is a director's composer. Uh, I think he, um, you know, I think he's unusually fastidious and devoted to that. And I'm saying this, and maybe someday I'll see him again and I'll ask him. But, uh, but used to be, it, it, it's hard to do a great score when you're not someone who, you know, who's trying to thump your chest all the time. Right. People don't notice. Uh, an example of that, my favorite score for the Academy contenders this year was Carter Burwell's score for Banshees and the Sharon. Mm. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I I wasn't as wild about the movie as some other people were, but I thought the score was fantastic because it was just Irish enough to put you on an island, on an Aran Island, and mm -hmm. just um, just time in time sensitive enough to have been recorded any time in the last hundred years. I mean, it it didn't scream when, and I think that movie is set in the thirties or forties. I forgot twenties actually. I believe twenties. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, but it, 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 the music is so timeless, uh, Carter Burwell has done. And I'm, once again, I should have mentioned him when you asked me about composers. I'm a massive Carter Burwell fan. Uh, mm. I, he, he, there's music in No Country for Old Men, but you have to take my word for it. Mm. <laughs> we'll never notice it. It's mixed so low and there's not much of it. But, you know, once again, that's a great film, I think. And, and, and Carter, he, he serves the film. He does. And, and yet he's quite capable of doing... Remember, I watched Doc Hollywood, that Michael J. Fox vehicle. Mm -hmm. He did the score for that. He did the score for Blind Side. Those are real Hollywood movies. I mean, he could do a Hollywood score, no problem. Or he can do something very special, very hidden, like No Country for Old Men or Banshees of Inna Sharon. Mm -hmm. That's very difficult to stay out of the way and serve your film, serve your characters, serve your narrative. Um, and, and it's selfless, in my opinion. It, it requires a selfless quality from the composer, not to mention talent. Well, bottom line, should film music call attention to itself? Should you be aware of it? When should you be aware of it? Should you ever be aware of it? No. Um, walking out of the movie theater, you can turn to the person you went with and say, boy, wasn't that great music? You can do that. Mm -hmm. uh, but not before that. You know what Henry Mancini's autobiography was called? What? They mentioned the music. And, <laughs> and and the funny thing is, Henry, I, I I never met him. We had the same agent for quite a while, and and they were always trying to get me together with him. And then I got sick, and they said, "You got to meet Hank." Um, now Henry, you know, I, he had the gift of melody. I mean, God, the, you know, Baby Elephant Walk from Hatari Moon River, for God's sakes. Uh, you know, um, he he had fabulous melodic sense, Pink Panther. But as much as he loved to write grandiose melodies his movies worked he you know he they they were not music videos with regrettable dialogue they, mm -hmm. they, were, they were movies i mean he was able to serve his film as well john williams obviously does that and he's a master of the big melody um but he, he in in you know you know spielberg wants him to do that i'm, I'm i'll bet anything it's been time when spielberg has said please which we, we just stop being bashful here just you know get out in front pump it up play. yeah pump it up i will tell you i've I heard a funny uh anecdote with some of my friends in the bso when they recorded saving private ryan which they recorded in in the music hall here in mm -hmm. boston um the way they do it there i was told is they do a first pass of the cue and then Spielberg walks up and they and they talk, he and John Williams talk, and John says, oh, we're going to take up, he takes out stuff and he overwrites these cues, which makes sense because if you want to make a change at the last minute, you can't very well add instruments, you can't right. write them, right, it takes, we have a, a library, people don't realize when you have an orchestral score, you have a small library, I mean, small army of people helping you, you have orchestrators, then you have librarians, people to get the parts together, keep them collated and put them on the musician stands. And if you've got 50 or 75 musicians, which we would have for a big orchestral score, that's a lot of paper to manage. And time is, you know, it's an incredibly expensive day. You know, tens of thousands of dollars are, are going down that day. So you have to have a finely honed military operation to be able to just get through the day efficiently. 
you're not going to write music at the last minute. That ain't going to happen. So what John Williams does apparently is he takes it off. He overwrites it and then he peels parts off. He just says to the oboes, tass it on bar 16 to 24. So the violins, you know, take guys, guys, go get a smoke. We're not using you on this one, you know, and, and he pulls things off, which I find fascinating. I mean, you, you have to be real sure of yourself to be able to pull that yeah. off. Well, he's only written, what, 450 scores? Uh, I don't know. I, yeah. I, 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 I don't know. Um, and apparently he's decided he's not retiring. <laughs> he's 91, I think, yeah. and he's not retiring. I'm thinking, okay, John, there are a whole lot of people wish you'd get the hell out of their way, you know? Yeah. Um, well, uh, but maybe he's aiming for 500 and then I'll call Maybe him. he is, could be. Yeah. You know, I'd like to hear well, them all, I don't mind saying. Um, the last thing I want to talk about is... Um, just your thoughts on the the instrumentation that Howard chose for this, um, the way, it, you know, the choices he could have made, what it could have sounded, what another composer might have done with this movie. Um, and and specifically the uh, about the choice not to use an orchestra and a choice yeah. to go with sound design most, until the most very people, end. Most people would probably have have wanted to go big, especially on lower strings. Um, well, higher strings, if they weren't any good, if they were real good, they would go on lower strings. For this. <laughs> and I'm not sure why I say that, but that, that would have been mine. Um, uh, the problem with um, sound design is, is that it, it can be too easy. Um, the tail wags the dog, as I said earlier, uh, there was a synthesizer called the D50 years and years ago and it had when it came out it had a program on it called native dance if i had one here and i played when i touched one key you'd say oh i know that sound everybody used it for about six months this mm -hmm. one stupid program because it sounded kind of cool it had a, a drum riff in it and it had a white noise trigger kind of thing and it had low string it was an interesting combination of sounds it got old and nobody used it again after the first six months but but people get on these sounds and, and they're so captivating, they don't bother making music with them. Well, not so James Newton Howard. Hey, he makes music with these sounds. He, he's picking things that have tones. They're not just white noise or pink noise. They, they, they're capable of playing notes and he, and he plays music with them. His percussion use is, one of the advantages of sound design is the, is the waveforms aren't thick. Um, they don't have overtones. Uh, overtones are harmonics, which natural sound waves have. And if you're using a lot of violins, the overtones fight each other and create a warmth, uh, a, a string warmth. If you've got if you've got 40 or 50 string players in one room, it's a big, thick sound. The problem with that is it fights dialogue and it fights audio effects. Mm -hmm. So it's a little more homogenized not quite the word but you can you can use a scalpel a little better with sound design there's no overtones in it the sounds are thinner and and you can turn it up more it doesn't get in the way of dialogue or sound effects um so there's a lot to recommend its use uh i i'm not sure why james didn't use strings but um, maybe he said, I'm going to start this way. And maybe the director liked it. And he said, well, why should I bother? Why should we spring for an orchestra? There, there are some strings in it, but it must have been just one or two sessions, much more relatively economical um, score to do. But he could guide it and direct it. I mean, it's really surgical, the score. It, it just mm. follows the dialogue and follows the scenes. Um, it, it's like I say, it's perfect. Uh, I, I can't really argue with any note in it. And then when I got to the score scene that I just played, I thought, my God, nobody pulls that off. Not like that, you know? Mm -hmm. It's an arresting scene. Of course, Tom Wilkinson is magnificent in it. Uh, mm -hmm. as, as a man coming, he, he, he's he got quite a bit of force there. Um, and uh, I think, I, I don't know, we used to use hardware for, for, for sound design, uh, boxes, uh, by which I mean. Um, things like Oberheim's and uh, emulators. Um, and some people still like them, but now it's all done inside the computer. Um, there are software programs you buy for sound design. Um, Omnisphere being is probably everybody's favorite. Um, and there's another one called Reason, which was one of the first ones. And it has a very good sound generator in it. Um, the problem is, if you saw the menu list of sounds available to you, mm. And I have to, uh, I'm just redoing music for uh, Frontline 
that I mentioned earlier, I did a theme in 1982. It's still in the year. They like it refreshed a little bit. And I'm doing some electronic applications, um, a combination of sampling and things like that um, to, re to, to refresh in the same music, using the same melodies um, that, that we used in 1982. Um, but when I go through the menu, I, I think... I. I've got to be somewhere in October, you know, <laughs> it just, it, it just, it just, I've got literally thousands of options of listening to these sounds. Where do I draw the line and say, well, I'll use that. Um, and, and I think a lot of times uh, someone will, a composer will have a staff of people and will say, okay, I need these warm, warm sounding pads. I need a pulses, things that go, boo -doo -doo, boo -doo 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 and I'm going to need, um, uh, some percussive, you know, battle drums. What what do you have for percussive sounds? And they'll and they'll give me a glossary here. I want to come in and in two hours, and I want to listen to a hundred sounds and pick four. Right. Um, if you're doing it by yourself, you're going to get lost in the weeds. Yeah. Uh, it's that simple. They're nice weeds, but boy, oh boy, you know, you 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 don't come up for air for a long time. Yeah. yeah. Um. The one moment that uh, that I recognize where the Michael Clayton score becomes orchestral is at the very, very end. Um, so, you know, it's been burbling, burbling along almost, you know, it's, it's I want to say it's thriller music, um, it's procedural music, uh, but it, it, it has a direction, it pulls you along. Um, as I said, it's very percussive um, with a lot of sort of regretful, rueful synth chords throughout it but at the end when Michael Clayton has essentially reclaimed his soul and he's sitting in the car or sitting in a taxi um and he gives the cab driver fifty dollars and says just drive around right. until the fifty dollars is out give me fifty dollars worth just drive The strings come up and they're orchestral and all of a sudden you're listening to a classic to me dramatic hollywood sound that actually harkens back to like work of the 50s and early 60s mm -hmm. um a lot of major chords a lot of resolution um mm -hmm. you're right it's very pretty and it's it's very pretty yeah. uh and i just thought it was uh, be curious and, if you... and, and, and yeah, my guess is my guess is he held off on that because you know what? For the first time, he's going to be at peace and he's going to be a human being right. at peace. So I get you know what? Let's reward everybody and Michael Clayton with some actual melody here. And, that's exactly how it functions. Yeah, and, um, and that's and that's what, like I say, James is good. I mean, it, it must have been tempting. I wonder if uh, I'd like to ask him if if uh, Tony Gilroy said, like, at some point, can we have some music more? And and he said, no, 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 no. You trust me? You're going to trust me on this. We're going to hold off. Uh, I'm not sure. Well, and the on the on the soundtrack album, it's a six minute cue, and at the end, he brings back the the thriller music. The the, you oh, know, the, the uh -huh. yeah, um, and. I, it's almost like a recapitulation. Oh yeah, this is what the movie was about. Right. You know, we're, we're, right. it's almost like the end credits. Um, it's just, it's the thinking that goes into it sort of fascinates me. Well, y you know, <clears throat> that's a funny thing. Um, composers are funny. We don't know each other very well because there's only one of us on a film at a time as a rule. Mm. Um, and uh, there's not a bar that you go to and hang out or anything. No, or? no. Well, if there is, they haven't invited me. Uh, but, um, uh, no, but we, re we do meet each other through our agents occasionally. And, and as I say, I played golf with James a couple of times, uh, mm -hmm. to a, from a fellow that did his Marty Davich, who was a terrific composer and, 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 uh, did the music for ER after James did the theme and the pilot. And then Marty did the rest of the series and Marty obviously was great friends with him and, and he had us play golf. And I'll tell you the thing about composers and that this is self-aggrandizing i'm afraid uh but most composers are smart um they um they they're smart enough to know how lucky they are to get paid to write music for them mm. it's, it's a hell of a gig and uh and it's hard to get and w when it works it's the greatest job in the world um but they have to be discerning and if they're going to get to a certain level they've got to be able to you know to understand the director and what the director wants and especially if they want to be like carter burwell um, or they want to go in different directions, you know, they, they, they don't want to do the same score all the time. Uh, but they want to really stretch their wings and fly. They, 
you know, they have to be able to speak a lot of languages. Mm. So they have to be able to speak the language of comedy, um, which I did with Don Ruse. They have to be able to speak, you know, the language of drama, which uh, I'd certainly done with John Sayles. I mean, you, you, you have to, if you speak just one language, you're going to, you're going to end up singing the same song and, uh, and, and people find out. So uh, the trick is to try to come up with a, you know, with a, with a, a new song every time. And, and, and I admire James Newton Howard tremendously because he does that. He, he does that. You can, you know, he, 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 he can do a big melody or not, but what he's going to do is he's going to figure out what that movie's looking for. Mm -hmm. John Williams does the same thing. Carter Burwell does the same thing. You know, what, what does this movie call for? Does it call for strings? Does it call for sound design? Does it call for um, some familiar traditional instruments? Does it call for hammer, dulcimer, banjo? I mean, what, what, what do I have to shape? What, what's going to work? Um, a lot of times the directors are tremendously helpful in saying that. They say, I, I hear this. But sometimes you hear that and it doesn't work. And you have to tell them, I'm sorry, I, I, I disagree. And they didn't. I, I had a... I did not distinguish myself in a movie called The Virginian once. I had to drop out of it, uh, they, or they replaced me, depending on who you talk to. And, and, and the problem was the director wanted four, he wanted electric guitar in a Western, and he wanted four cellos. And I made a mistake. I fought that. I shouldn't, shouldn't have taken the job unless I was 100% behind it. And that, and, and I, when I think of mistakes, that was the biggest mistake I think I've ever made is I fought with the director. What, what an idiot. You know, it's only going to work if you don't fight the director. Right. Did um, he get his guitar and four cellos? I never saw it. <laughs> anytime, anytime, anytime I've um, ever didn't finish a movie, I've never seen it. Um, mm. I want to know. Uh, and do you, uh, do you watch? Do you watch the movies you've scored? Only uh, twenty or thirty years later, because mm. I can't change it. What do I do if I go? Oh my God! I, I made a mistake there. I mean, it's too late to do anything about it. I would plunge myself into, you know, <laughs> into severe depression. Uh, but if I wait 20 or 30 years, then I don't remember doing it as a rule. I don't remember that much ah. about it. It's like hearing it for the first time. I can enjoy it like it's somebody else's music. Right. So so I I don't, I, I in the beginning I went, I went to see, uh, I would often for John's, I'd go with John. We go here, cause, but back then we were trying to figure out how to mix films. How to dub it uh, at the sound design, I mean, sorry, dialogues, you know, effects and music. We were trying to figure out what the relative balance should be. And to do that, we'd have to go into different movie theaters and hear and see what happened in transition. Um, because in low budget films, especially, didn't have much money for that sort of thing. And right. sometimes it would be difficult. We try to do preparing. But after about the first 10 or 20 movies, I, I, I said, I, I don't want to do this anymore because I, I won't be able to change anything. And it'll drive me completely bonkers, mm. you know. Um, so, no, I, 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 I didn't. Uh, don't go to hear him to tell you the truth. <laughs> no. I don't know. It's probably it one of my sense. many failings. <laughs> no, no, no. I think it makes sense. I, I know a lot of people who work on films that don't watch their films. You know, maybe oh. you're there at the premieres and then they're on to the next thing. You know, that's right. That's yeah. basically right. Um, my better half, Dee Dee, wants she wants to see Walk on the Moon, by the way, because I I, I thought Walk on the Moon was a wonderful film. Oh, it I, is. I, your wife has exquisite taste. And uh I'll it, let her it, know that. Yeah, it was a really, really cool movie and, and and great movie to do. I had so much fun with the director. I mean, it was really something. Uh and Tony uh, Goldwyn, right? Yeah, Tony Goldwyn, yeah, he was wonderful to work. And uh yeah. and and um you know. I could watch that movie. I'm, I'm thinking of watching it with her. Should, should. Um, yeah, my wife should. watches it about once a year. Once a year. <laughs> that's really funny. Yeah, uh, yeah. That's good for her. Yeah. Uh, okay, so that's all we have time for today, unfortunately. Um, thank you, Mason. Thank you. Oh, my pleasure. I knew I would enjoy it. And I, I sure did. Um, in uh, coming weeks, keep an ear out for uh, new episodes of the Watchcast, where my guests will include. Film critics uh, Sam Adams and Odie Henderson and more. I'm Ty Burr, and you are listening to Ty Burr's Watchcast, part of the Substack newsletter Ty Burr's Watch List. You can find more podcasts, reviews, and tips to navigating the streaming video landscape at tyburrswatchlist.substack.com. Thank you, Mason Daring, for being my guest, and thank you all for listening. Great. And that is it.